Okay, so thank you and welcome. Uh, so as Troy said, I teach philosophy here at St. Norbert College, or uh, at Moraine Valley Community College. And uh, in my teaching of philosophy, one of the courses I teach is ethics. And I, I've come across many students in my teaching who sort of have this uncritical acceptance of this idea that when it comes to ethical things, anyone's opinion is just as good as anyone else's, even if those two opinions are totally contradictory or opposed to one another. And this bothers me in several ways. It bothers me as a philosopher, uh, but it bothers me as a member of Moraine Valley Community College because I don't think it's what college education is really about, nor do I think it's what Moraine Valley as an institution is really about. So you might wonder, well, what are we really about as an institution? And unless you didn't know, Moraine Valley does have certain core values which we take to define ourselves as an institution. And those values are, are these, diversity, respect, responsibility, integrity, and fairness. But what do those really mean? What does it really mean to value diversity or to value respect or to value the rest of these? That's still something of an open question. And you might think that those students who I've come across in my own teaching are sort of valuing diversity in a sense. I mean, if they have different opinions, there's your diversity. And even if those opinions are contradictory to one another or opposed, they're both equally good. And so it's good that we have that difference. But again, I don't think that's the way to understand what we mean as an institution when we say we are valuing diversity. So I want to talk about Plato's Cave, a very famous passage from his work, The Republic. But before I do that, I want to talk a little bit about the philosophical background and Plato's philosophical influences. So in the ancient Greek world, there's this famous philosopher known as Protagoras. And he's very famous for having said, man is the measure, or to be not gender biased here, human is the measure, meaning whatever anyone thinks about anything is just as good as whatever anyone else thinks about anything. So that if you feel cold, you are cold. And if you feel hot, you are hot. Well, that sounds OK when it's about cold and hot. But what about ethical or moral issues? Like if you feel x is right and the next person feels x is wrong, you're both right, says Protagoras. And this is a view that's usually called relativism or ethical relativism by philosophers. And it's actually the same view, more or less, that I've come across in many of my students' minds, which they uncritically accept. The idea here, again, is all opinions are equally good. And it doesn't matter what the topic is that we're talking about. Again, I don't think that's the way to understand what we mean as an institution when we say we value diversity of opinion and diversity of perspective and, and the rest of our core values. So another influence on Plato is another very famous philosopher known as Socrates. And Socrates is famous for his search for truth. He was told by the oracle at Delphi that he was the most wise person in all of the world, and this quite surprised him. How can I be the wisest person? I don't think I know anything. He set off on this lifelong quest of investigating and talking to other people who claim to have wisdom. But through all of this, he wasn't able to find anyone who really knew what they were talking about because they always ended up contradicting themselves. And so he realized after this lifelong search that he's the wisest person precisely because of the fact that he admits his ignorance. He knows he doesn't know. And at least he's got that on everyone else who thinks they know even though they don't know. Yet in admitting his ignorance, and this is an important sort of philosophical influence on Plato and the cave passage, which we'll look at in just a minute, Socrates is assuming throughout that, st that still there is truth. There is truth. And that truth is the very thing of which he is ignorant. And it is the very thing that other people claimed to have known, but were shown upon examination to not really have known in the first place. So just a little bit more background on Plato. Uh, Plato's most famous work, as I said earlier, is a dialogue called The Republic. And in Plato's Republic, the topic of discussion ranges over a very wide uh, subject matter. But one of the things that's talked about in an important passage in the Republic is this question, what's the most important thing to know? What's the most important thing to obtain in life? And Plato's answer to that question is this, the truth, the good. That's what's most important to know. That's what's most important to obtain. And that's what we all want. I mean, if you compare this for a little bit to, say, wanting health. It seems fair to say most people want health, but they don't want fake health or made up health. They want true health. They want real health. They want good health. 
Plato thinks that's true and thinks it applies to sort of a general search in life that all humans are sort of engaged in. Yet he admits no one fully knows what the truth is, no one fully knows what the good is. And this is something he gets from his teacher Socrates. We want it, but we don't know what it is. So what's that like? What's the human condition like? That's sort of the question. What is that like? And with this then, Plato launches into the famous allegory of the cave. He says, this condition, this situation, that we want the truth and yet we don't know what it is, is like this. Imagine, Plato says, that there's this cave. And in this cave, at the very bottom of the cave, there's these prisoners and they're chained up to a wall such that they can only look straight in front of them, they can't turn their head side to side, they can't talk to anyone else, they've been there their whole lives. So that shadow on that wall is all they've ever seen. It's the only thing that they've ever been exposed to or experienced. Behind the wall are other people who hold puppets and various statues, and behind those people there's a fire burning, which of course is going to cast the shadows on the wall that the prisoner who's chained up at the bottom is looking at. And so Plato makes the comment first that this is a weird sort of setup to imagine, but it's not unlike our own actual condition in life vis-a-vis -vis our search for truth and our ignorance of that very thing that we're searching for. So now Plato says, okay, well imagine that this prisoner is asked, what is a cat? His answer is going to be, that thing I see, that's a cat. Notice the arrow there pointing at the shadow. He's never seen anything but shadows, so he thinks that's all there is to a cat. That, of course, is a false answer, and Plato is well aware that we know that's not really a cat, it's merely a shadow. But this prisoner has really no idea. So now, Plato says, imagine if this prisoner is released and brought back over to the other side of the wall. What's going to happen to him? Well, first of all, he's going to be blinded by the light. He's been in the darkness, literally, his whole life. He comes over by the fire, he can't really see anything. It's too bright. But after he's been there for a while, he gets used to it, he becomes comfortable, and he starts to realize, upon looking about himself, that that thing on the stick, that puppet in this diagram, is actually what causes the shadow to be cast on the wall. The only time the shadow is cast on the wall is when the puppet of the cat goes by. So now suppose he's asked again, what is a cat? Now his answer is going to be, it's that. We still know this answer is what? False. We know this answer is still false. He thinks he's got the truth now. Notice there is a sense in which he's made progress. He no longer thinks that the shadow is a cat. He now knows that that's a shadow. But he's still wrong because he thinks it's a shadow of a cat, when the truth is, of course, that it's a shadow of a puppet. So he's made progress, and yet he's still ignorant. And that's going to be a kind of important lesson to remember when I come back at the end of my talk here to Moraine Valley's core values. So now Plato says, OK, he's made some progress. He's still ignorant. What if he gets outside of the cave? What if he climbs up outside of this steep uh, ascent and he's brought out into the very light of the sun? Once again, what's going to happen to him? He's going to be totally blinded. He's not going to be able to see anything. For quite a while, he's going to be thrown into confusion. And yet, once he gets used to the light of the sun, he'll be able to look around him and see that living, breathing kitty cat standing before him. So now, if asked once again, what is a cat, his answer is going to be, that's a cat. That living, breathing thing is a cat. Once again, he's made progress. He's now understanding something to be true more than what he understood before. That is to say, he thought that the shadow was a cat at first. That turned out to be wrong. Then he thought that the puppet was a cat. Now he realizes that is wrong. His answer now is, that is a cat. Now we might think that's where to stop. Plato uh, doesn't think that's really the final answer. So I want to explain that just a little bit. Plato then says, well, imagine if this guy, upon getting used to the sun, were to be so bold as to look up directly into the sun. Now I don't recommend anyone actually do this. Uh, it's not a good idea. But this is an allegory, of course. So upon looking at the sun, sort of what would happen to this guy? What would he eventually realize? And Plato thinks what he would realize is that the sun is what causes all of the other things he's been experiencing up to this point. That means if there were no sun, 
there would be no plants, and if there were no plants, there would be no mice, and if there were no mice, there could be no cats to eat the mice, so cats couldn't even exist. So the sun causes the cat to exist. And if there were no cat to exist, then those puppeteers down in the cave never would have thought to make a puppet of a cat. So the sun also causes the puppet to exist. And of course, if there were no puppets of cats down in the cave, there would be no shadow of puppets of cats to be cast against that back wall. So the sun also causes the shadow to exist. Plato thinks upon looking at the sun, this guy will have a sort of epiphany, a realization that the truth is something much bigger, much deeper, much broader than anything he ever realized way back when, when he was chained up down in the bottom of that cave in a deep state of dark ignorance. Now for Plato, without going too much into the specifics of his philosophy here, the sun symbolizes what Plato calls forms. And Plato thinks of these forms as the truth. The forms are the truth. The forms are the real natures of things. And that's what we seek to understand. That's what we seek to understand scientifically. That's what we seek to understand philosophically, ethically, morally. That's Plato's view. So the idea that Plato has in the full picture of this cave is that the cat is ultimately a copy of the form, a copy of what Plato calls the form of the cat, just in the sense that all the cats there are share something, they have something in common, and for Plato, that common thing they share is being an embodiment of what he calls the form of the cat, or what we might today call the species of being a cat. Catness would be another way to put it. Uh, not Katniss Everdeen from uh, Hunger Games, but cat. Ness. And of course, the, the puppet is a copy of the cat, and at the very bottom of things here, the shadow is a copy of the puppet. So once this guy is outside and has seen the sun, he's now made some serious, definite progress. And we can understand that from our perspective, because we knew all along that the thing he was seeing at the very bottom of the cave was, after all, nothing but a shadow. So this prisoner has definitely made progress, but part of that progress was also involving being blinded anew at each level. Every time he sort of makes some steps forward, he's thrown into confusion at first. And this is analogous, Plato thinks, to the efforts we all sort of have to make and the experience we all have in educating ourselves and becoming educated. We become comfortable or complacent with things as they stand and with our received opinions. And to be educated and exposed to different ways to think about things can be very shocking, can be very confusing. Plato is sort of recognizing that in this allegory of the cave and admitting that is a sort of a key experiential component of what it is to come to gain knowledge and get closer to the truth. This is still, however, as I said, a making of progress. We realize, we us realize, that the prisoner made progress when he moved over the wall and understood that the thing at the very bottom was after all just a shadow and the thing on the stick, which he calls a cat, he's not quite right, but he's closer to the truth. And then he makes further progress as he gets up out of the cave. So there's a sort of sense of progress, a sense of uh, making headway toward the truth. Furthermore, Plato also discusses the fact that this prisoner, the released prisoner now, if she were to return back down into the cave after having seen the sun, she would be completely misunderstood by the people who are still in the cave and never got out. Imagine she goes back down into the cave after having understood that the sun causes the cat and the sun causes the puppet and the sun causes the shadow and tries to tell all of this to the people who are still only seeing shadows. Those people who are only seeing shadows will have like virtually no idea what she's talking about. Yet we still know that she's talking about the truth and they're sort of stuck in the darkness of their own ignorance, which is also part of, of what Plato's getting at here. So this cave analogy, among other things, is a sort of effort by Plato to explain the nature of education and the nature of the educational enterprise, which is something we're all involved here as members of Moraine Valley. And so as it pertains to your education, among other things, one thing that Plato is saying is that knowledge of the truth cannot be poured into you. As an instructor, I can't just take what I know and sort of 
hand it to you on a silver platter. It doesn't work that way. Just like the prisoner who's seen the sun can go back down into the cave and say, hey guys, there's a sun out there, but they're not going to understand that at all. They have to make their own way up out of the darkness. They have to make their own way up out of the cave. This takes great effort on your part. This takes great effort on anyone's part because of the sense of confusion that one is thrown into. We have a tendency as human beings to become complacent and comfortable with what we are familiar with, but what's familiar may not, after all, be what's best, what's true, or what's good, Plato is telling us. So education as a process is always good, but is always hard. And that's a sort of a general lesson uh, that Plato's trying to tell us with regard to the educational process. So how does all this relate back to Moraine Valley's core values? Well, if you remember, the first of those values was diversity. And one way to understand the valuing or the goodness of diversity would be that relativist way, that protagoras way, where diversity is good just as long as there are some different people with some different opinions. I don't think that's the way we want to understand our defining values as an institution. Instead, if we think about the cave, the allegory of the cave here as it pertains to the progress that people are making, different prisoners at different stages of release are making different errors and yet getting closer to the truth. So Plato's sort of saying to all of us, all of us are these prisoners. If you remember, the context of this discussion was, what's the most important thing to know? The truth, the good. That's what we all want, but none of us fully understand it. So what's that like? That's like being in this cave. That pertains to all of us. So the goodness of diversity for Plato is predicated on the fact that no one knows the truth fully. Whatever I may know, you may not, and vice versa. We can help each other along to make progress by rationally discussing and debating with one another. Respect sort of flows from that. This ascent, this, this path upward out of the cave is difficult for everyone. And therefore, we should respect anyone who's engaged in this ascent, even if they're at a different stage than we may perhaps be. We owe it to ourselves to make this effort to climb up out of the cave because it's good for all of us. It's good for me, it's good for you, it's good for the community. So we owe it to ourselves. That's our own responsibility to ourselves as individuals and to ourselves as a community. The sense of the value of integrity for Plato hinges on the fact that there is a truth. And even if no one knows it fully, that's what we need to aim for. Aim for the truth and let that be your guide. How can we figure out the truth given the diversity of opinions? In an academic setting, or even in a scientific or research setting, or a more community-wide setting, rational debate, discussion, is the only method to sort of sift out among the opinions the ones that pass the test of uh, logic and research and evidence. So the truth shall be our guide. And finally, fairness as a value. Look, we're all struggling. Maybe none of us are at the very bottom of the cave, but none of us have seen the sun either. So we're all struggling, Plato thinks. And yet we all have the same exact goal, the truth, the good. So we should be fair and even-handed in our dealings with one another. If we come across someone with a different opinion from ours, it's best not to just shut them down, but to engage in debate with them and discussion. For all we know, at our stage of ignorance, you may have something to teach me that I had never even conceived of, and vice versa. So we can help one another out. We can help one another make progress by helping each other think about things in a new way. So maybe, after all, Dr. Jenkins, our illustrious pe president, and Plato are besties, <laughs> even though they never even met each other in actual life, of course. Okay, so thank you. <laughs>